Jeremy, how would you describe the world as you see it today versus the world that was unfolding one year ago? One year ago, mid-March, I actually genuinely felt almost, almost panic, almost real genuine worry, which for an ER doctor like me is extremely unusual. I, I started you know, doing some media and some writing and projecting a sense of that we, we had some things we could do better and some concerns. But I'll tell you on the inside a year ago, um, I, I, mid-March, I was absolutely, I wouldn't say terrified, but for the first time, I really felt like I was entering a period where I had no idea what would come next. And that's really an uncomfortable situation for anyone to be in, but especially a physician. So yes, one year ago was the strangest time in my life because we were just waiting to find out uh, what was happening in New York. And it was sort of like, okay, Boston is next, right? It's coming to Boston. So it, it was sort of this moment of, okay, here we go. Um, are we ready? And so that was really, it was, it was, it was terrifying in a way. I wasn't sleeping. I, I wasn't eating. I actually lost 13 pounds in March and April last year, even though I didn't exercise at all. I, I dropped my exercise routine and I lost a ton of weight because I just couldn't, I couldn't do anything but think about all this and work and do. And so a and year worry. Later, I, what, what, pardon? And worry. And worry. Yeah. And just try to, I was trying to take that worry and and make it useful so i wasn't like sitting around like oh my god what are we going to do it was i i would say i just kind of sublimated it into something useful and trying to get involved with policy and writing and research and advocacy and talking about this on television or whatever it would be but it was certainly i was trying it was it was absolutely an expression of that so a year later it, we have a vaccine we have case counts coming down and while I still have concerns about the variants and about some, some aspects of, of what we face ahead of us, I feel a hundred times better. I have, I've gained the weight back, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> and uh, I now have to exercise again in order to, to keep things under control. So that's actually a good thing. I now require sleep. I didn't require sleep a, month, a year ago. I was just like, I was not tired and I was four or five hours a night of sleep and it was not a problem. Now I'm sort of back to a much more kind of healthy place, both, you know, personally in terms of just like how I'm doing and also just with my out, my outlook on how everybody else is doing. I just feel like just get them to the, get them to the vaccination sites and, you know, we'll, we'll see just how much of that fixes this. It almost sounds like you're describing a sci-fi movie with this sense of dread, like this amorphous monster that's kind of approaching that kind of fear that gets generated of the unknown. And it, it must have been, even though I know you're a, you know, a macho guy and everything, and you're a physician and you're stoic and all that jazz, it must have that that sense of dread must have just been overwhelming. I have to say I didn't acknowledge it in that way, but my actions reflect that. So in my, in my mind, I was just literally like using that as fuel to do things. I didn't come home to my wife, Kate, and my, my daughter, Maya, and was like, oh, I'm scared, I'm worried. It, so it didn't come out like that at all. And, and I'm, I'm not saying that um, to like sound like I'm cool. I, I just don't, I just, it's a psychological defense mechanism is to take that stuff and to put it into something else. And at some point though, you're absolutely right. I had to confront the fact that like, yeah, it is terror. It is fear. It's worry about my family and about my friends and about other people. And I think I had this realization at some point that we weren't going to have the tests. We, and we weren't, people weren't going to wear masks when we realized that we needed to wear masks. And I feel like there was those moments where I just felt like my, I could feel like the butterflies in my stomach and the nerves like, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. We know what to do, but we're not doing it. And that made me angry really just angry, um, which, which I occasionally would let that come out on Twitter. But for the most part, I, again, I use that anger to, to drive what I do every day. But yeah. What were you most angry about? Do you feel like you're in a therapy session? Yes, you're very good at this. Um, yeah, I'm not supposed to cry. <laughs> no, no. But okay. I feel like, uh, what's her name? Uh, what's Barbara Loretta? Walker. No, Rocco. Uh, uh, Lorraine Bracco in The Sopranos. I feel a little bit like Lorraine yeah. Bracco and you're Tony Soprano, but go ahead. What no, were no. you most angry about? 
I was, I became angry when we started to learn so much and that that knowledge could save so many lives and that that was somehow that was politicized and it became um, some kind of, um, it became some kind of boon for people to want to advocate for things that would harm people and, or the things that were so basic and so inexpensive and free weren't being done. So why was it until July 13th that, that President Trump didn't wear a mask? He wore a mask for the first time on July 13th. And I thought, okay, well, better late than never. And then a week later, he hired Scott Atlas, who down, who said that masks were bad or that they could harm you. And basically that, you know, the undermining of science was just like this project that they were onto. Um, so when, when I saw that, I, I got angry when the simple things were being um, said were politicized or they were said um, didn't work and things that absolutely had no chance of helping like hydroxychloroquine were being said oh this is going to be the great thing this is going to fix all of it's going to go away or just magical thinking and so knowing that we had these like this dissonance between everything we knew and learn had learned and what we were actually many of us were doing and I just and then you watch and you watch the cases go up and you would say yeah, well, in two weeks, it's going to be bad. And, and then the naysayers would say, oh, you keep saying that. And we say, well, yeah, but we were right, actually. Look, the cases got worse. The numbers got worse. We're just saying it could still get worse. And so we would say, look, in two weeks. But if you look two weeks later, it was like, yeah, and we were right then and we we're right now. So that was the part, that's the part that I think is so frustrating. It's like it's not like we're, we're powerless against all of this. You look at a place like New Zealand and even in, and look at places like China in the fall, we decided to be incompetent. And that that has such a, a mortality correlation. People died because of our incompetence. And that's what really it was hard. To, it's been hard to, to uh, just observe that. And, and I study kind of big data, like um, national kind of excess mortality and you know just how historic is this crisis. And so I see these numbers and every single one of them is a person. Um, and it's just, uh, it's really, it's that's hard to stomach. The other thing I'm sure that was very upsetting for you and other people in the medical field was the lack of PPE. You know, the fact that in those early months, doctors, nurses, hospitals, staff, custodians, cafeteria workers, they were not being protected properly. Yeah, I was lucky where I was that we rationed for sure. Like there's certainly a policy of like, you know, I can't, in the old days, I could just grab an N95 mask, like, you know, just like open bin, you know? Nowadays, I have to go and swipe my badge and, you know, they keep track of how often you're using them. So we were lucky in the sense that we didn't have to literally go without. But absolutely, there were places where my colleagues who I know were telling me, look, we have no gowns, we have no masks, like people, you know, the pictures of people like taking their trash bags and using them as gowns and reusing masks and trying to see patients who are dying of coronavirus at using basically masks that you know, you'd rather have one that was bought on Etsy, you know, like people were just trying to figure anything out. So that, that to me, exactly. It's so, that, that just blew me away that my colleagues died. Some of my colleagues died because there was not enough um, mobilization of resources that we have, right? I ne I'm never going to sit here and say, you know, why can't we cure X disease or Y disease or why can't we, you know, I'm talking about things we know how to do and things that we can do if we just want to. So that's the part where it's so frustrating. It's when, is when you have the ability, but not the desire or not the will. Looking back on it, whose screw up was the whole PPP dilemma? Yeah, the PPE dilemma, I would say, absolutely this is a place where the federal government has a role to play. We can't possibly um, pretend like at the local level that people can just suddenly print money, right? The, the only people in the country who can print money is the federal government. And when you have a, a, essentially a war breaking out, it's a war against uh, a virus, but it's a war, you have to think of it that way. And so if there's a, and some, some it's funny, some of my colleagues don't like that analogy, but actually Tony Fauci uses it and I think it's apropos because it truly is like that. And you can't say, okay, you know, we've been invaded by some foreign power. So, uh, uh, Oregon, you're on your own. Good luck to you. Hope you have some tanks lying around. And they probably do, and they scramble them up, but they don't know what to do, right? So that's how I feel about coronavirus. It, it's, a, it's a war. It's a national war against a virus. 
And so you can't print money on this on the local level. You have to really use the national resources that we we do actually have the ability to do this. You look at the the vaccine story. It's amazing. Like they, they did that right. But if we had done PPE right, if we had done testing right, even if we had done um, a really coherent policy with shelter in place and uh, quote unquote lockdowns, I don't like that term, but we could have had more freedom sooner and hundreds of thousands more lives saved. I mean, that it's, it does, um, it does. It's mind boggling. Yeah. Isn't it? It's mind boggling. Yeah. And there's this sense of like, once it's happened that there, that it's unavoidable. Like, oh, well, it couldn't have happened any other, any other way, right? Like, what could you have done? It's too late now. And that's just not the way to think about it. Like we actually do have, like I, I spent a lot of time thinking about what I call COVID-25 or flu-29, whatever the next one's going to be. And what would we do differently if we had to deal with this starting tomorrow? And the lessons are so clear to me. And we knew some of them early on and we could have applied them now. And so I'm frustrated that we haven't applied them. I'm also worried that we won't even apply them next time. So that's the part that I think is, uh, it, gets me, it gets me out of bed every day to, to do the, the public health work that I'm, that I'm doing. But um, it's, it's really, um, it's alarming because again, we have so much we can do, right? And look at the vaccine story. I mean, there's no reason why we can't have similar successes in other areas if we choose to. So I'll talk about sort of the next time in a moment, but let me mm-hmm. go back. Um, uh, when did you have that moment, Jeremy, where you thought, Houston, we've got a problem? Oh, yeah. What, was that, one, what was that one moment? I'm going to tell you two moments that happened because they're connected. So in late February, I was working. We heard about coronavirus and we had a patient come into the ER who had been somewhere in Asia sometime in the last month and they had a cough and they wanted to isolate this patient and they wanted to do the whole thing and get the hazmat suits out and everything else. And I was just like, really? That seems really over the top guys. This patient was nowhere near the, the outbreak in China. Like Asia is a big place. Can we please not like go a little nutty here? And they did the, they did the whole thing and they called the CDC and they're like, no. So that was like part one. Then three weeks later or two weeks later, I'm working an overnight shift in my ER and I have a patient with pneumonia and I look at their x-ray and I, I just, my eyes go, whoa, that's a nasty pneumonia. That's all over the lungs. That's wow. Okay. It's kind of an older person. And so I occasionally will see that, but pretty unusual, but I was pretty impressed. Two hours later, pneumonia, younger patient, middle-aged, same x-ray. Oh my God. Like, look at that x-ray. Like, that is just nasty. I was just like, check this out to my colleague. Like, look at that thing. Third patient overnight in one night, same x-ray, like nasty pneumonia. Now it's a, now we would call this classic COVID pneumonia. Like now I could like look at that x-ray and be like COVID. But at the time, I just never seen it, right? And other than in the New England Journal of Medicine or something like that, where they had a couple of images posted already. So I said to my colleagues or whatever, I said, we need to test these patients for coronavirus. And we got the little list out and it said, well, do they have the criteria that meets the testing requirements? No, no, they don't. I was like, well, I don't care. Look at this, look at this, look at these x-rays. There's three of them, you know, in one night, we need to test everybody. So, and we didn't, we didn't have the tests. We weren't able to do it. And so I had this, that panic where I was, where I was thinking, oh gosh, these people are everywhere. They're going to be everywhere. And we're not even able to detect it until until it's too late, until they have x-rays that look like this. And when, when that happened, I just completely realized like, yeah, Houston, we have a problem. This is, we have an, a major crisis right here and we don't even know it yet. We don't even, we can't even detect it. And so I went from being the person who said, why are we testing this random person to a few weeks later saying, we need to test every person with a pulse. Like every single person needs a test many times because this thing is gonna be everywhere and look what it does to people's lungs. So that was for me the moment. What happened to those three people? I don't know about uh, two of them, but I, I assume they were okay. I don't know. One of them was an older person, uh, had a protracted ICU stay and actually made it um, as far as I know. I don't know the longer term uh, in terms of made it on paper. In other words, they were discharged back to their home. I don't know what their, what, you know, the overall condition was, but yeah, they, these were not deaths, but um, they were harrowing. 
you couldn't test people for quite a while. Why did it take so long to be able to test these people? The tests weren't available. You just simply didn't have the tests. The, the CDC had a major fiasco about this. They didn't develop the test in time. They had quality problems on the inside. It's one of the great um, you know, mistakes of how that was managed. Um, you know, when you think about the fact, what do you need to make a test? You need to understand the genetics of, of the virus or the bacteria. You need to understand um, some, you need to have something, some molecular understanding of what to test for. Katie, we had that information in January. When you look at the people who made the vaccine, they, they had this thing sequenced in days. You, in, in a matter of weeks, the protein structures were available. So we actually, interestingly enough, the, the, the prototypes for the vaccines were already being developed in February and we didn't have a test that was functional in the United States. So it just took time to ramp up and to catch up. So to me, it's like some of that infrastructure exists right now for, you know, quote unquote, COVID-25, like make the swabs, make the, the viral media, make sure you have the system set up. And then at the last second, swipe, swap in whatever um, molecule you need it to be. But we didn't do any of that. And so it, it just sounds, took time. It, it sounds like it was a major public health disaster that the CDC oversaw. I mean, I hate to play the blame game, but it seems to me the CDC was responsible for really screwing up COVID testing early on. Yeah, they have a big, a, a big, um, yeah, they have some responsibility there. I think that, um, you know, yes, they, more funding would have helped. I think uh, maybe not just having the CDC do this, you could outsource this to other groups. There's a lot of things you could have done. Um, I One of the first things I did it, it, during this crisis was to write a letter to Vice President Pence through his chief of staff, who I was able to connect to and say, look, we need we need a test for every American and we need drive-throughs. We need like, to do what South Korea was doing. We need to, you know, the way I say it now is, you know, if, if there's a McDonald's drive-through anywhere near you, there should be a testing drive-through. It's good. That's how it should look. Just everywhere should just have this. And, and, I, and I, I wrote this paragraph. I said, look, Vice President Pence, the opportunity to save thousands of lives in a matter of weeks is an unusual opportunity. Why don't we take it? Why don't we become the envy of the world? Why don't we show everybody what can be done with American technology, ingenuity, mobilizing resources on the ground, the state army national guards could erect these tents, we could do lots of stuff and we could just really do this. And, and instead we got basically, um, yeah, you know, Jared Kushner's looking into it. Is that what you were told? I mean, that's what it was basically, if you look in the media, I mean, we were told that they had their own people looking at it and they were gonna do testing and they were gonna, you know, they were saying, yeah, yeah, we're really interested in this, we're gonna do this. And then you read like the follow-up stories later on and basically it was just like this, huge, like, you know, circular firing squad of like trying to, you know, they screwed that up even worse. I mean, it, no, nothing happened, right? I mean, it was just, it was just amateur hour. So yeah, that, I mean, that to me is such a tragedy because it, it really set the tone. Let's talk about what your ER was like, Jeremy, during the spring of 2020. Just describe the scene for me. Okay. So Boston is a very different scene than New York. So New York is the scene where it, the life is falling apart and you know it's crowded and it's, uh, as, as my old mentor boss at Elmhurst Hospital said, it was twice as, as crowded and 10 times as sick, right? That was, that was New York ERs and I just, you know, I almost have survivor's guilt for not having been there. Like I trained there and I wanted to have been there. Um, granted that would have been dangerous, but you know, that's what I signed up for. Boston was quite different than that. We were, it was super, it was just eerie because it was so quiet in the ERs except for COVID. So nobody was showing up for anything. And partly because there were just fewer emergencies. There were just so many fewer accidents. In fact, there were fewer heart attacks. Some people were worried they were happening at home. I've actually come to believe that that's part of it. I've also come to believe that there were just, there were fewer heart attacks. Um, we always talk about how bad pollution days can have more heart attacks. There was no pollution last, last spring. Right. Um, so we had fewer triggers. So the ER was really quiet and, and, and eerie and weird, but it was like something out of like an M. Night Shyamalan movie where it's like everyone's got it. You know, it's like I would I would do a test and they come in with a cough. They have coronavirus. They would come in with abdominal pain and we'd get a CAT scan and pick the bottom of the lungs up. 
coronavirus. And so, so you had this, this two things happening at once. Everyone had it. And then on top of it, the sickest people who were, who were really in trouble, it was all Corona. Um, so it was just, it was, it was extremely eerie and weird. Um, but it wasn't hectic. It wasn't rushed because again, it, the, our volumes as many ERs were all over the country were much lower than usual. But those people who did come in were quite sick. And at that time, of course, we weren't vaccinated. We didn't necessarily know about the transmission dynamics. I mean, we, we were learning on the fly. So it was really strange and, um, and surreal, but it was never out of control. And, but, but I think always in the back of my mind was, when is the watershed moment going to have, happen? Are we gonna have a New York moment here? And we never did it where I work, but you know, it was, it was always on the back of your mind. How hard was it? By the way, I know that idea of everybody has it. You've got a cough. Oh, you've got it. That happens when medical students are studying various illnesses. They all think each other has whatever illness they're studying, right? So it's not surprising this was happening in the ER or among doctors on, on the staff. Well, I mean, I'm talking about looking at the patients and this. We would oh, just, the patients. Yeah. I'm saying everyone had it. Like and we would be working them up for, because we were learning about asymptomatic disease and there was so much asymptomatic disease in terms of someone would come in for a kidney stone and the CAT scan would pick up the bottom of their lungs and they happen to have, you're like, oh, by the way, uh, you have coronavirus. And they're like, what? I came here because my back hurts. Um, so it was just weird in that way. The the staff, yeah, there was definitely some, some concern about the staff. I mean, look, I remember just, just not wanting anyone to get anywhere near me. Just like, keep away from me. Like, uh, don't touch me. Right. Um, so yeah. How did you go about then treating patients if you were so paranoid about people getting near you? I mean, what was that like as a physician who is trained and is passionate about taking care of other people to have to do it uh, at arm's length or more? Yeah, it's really hard um, to to connect with people through a shield and an eye mask and a, you know N95 mask and a and a big gown because you just look. It doesn't it doesn't matter how you look, but you look like yourself. And so when someone can't see that you are you, it's just really hard for, to connect with them. And it, what it does is it sort of made the medicine feel really impersonal, which maybe was an okay thing, sort of a, almost like a defense mechanism, like a distance thing. I don't think we spent nearly as much time in those patient rooms as um, we usually do. I know we didn't. We, we went in less often. I was trying to minimize trips. So if we could go in and do something for the nurses or they could go and do something for us, like, you know, we were trying not to, you know, go in too, too much. So it was just different. And, but I think the biggest thing, everyone, the patients mostly understood that, that situation. So I think that really helped. I think the, the, the harder piece um, actually was trying to talk patients through it. And because the fear of, because of, some people in the early days had heard, you know, okay, well, I have like a one in 20 chance of dying here, like a 5% mortality rate. That's, we're, that's what everyone was saying. And I, I thought that it was much lower than that, but those were, that's what the WHO was saying and everything. So the, the hard part was to try to like talk your patients sort of to, to reassure them without downplaying. So it's like, yes, this is a dangerous, dangerous disease. And, but here's, here's, some, here's some things that we can say are good. So you're always trying to like spin it in a way that's um, somewhat uplifting if that's appropriate. But in some cases, there's, that's not appropriate either. So I think the hard part is, was as physicians, we're so used to being able to say to our patients, okay, I've seen this before. Here's what's gonna, here's what, here's, let me tell you what's gonna happen. Or let me, let me give you a range of possibilities based on your condition. And so we give our patients, I like to give my patients like a really frank and honest assessment of where they're at. So I don't sugarcoat, but I don't, uh, I'm not a you know, doomsdayer either. I'll say, look, here's some things that could, that could go down and I want you to understand that. So you, you know, just know what to expect. With what I found so difficult with this disease was we didn't know. So how can I look at someone and say, oh yeah, I've seen this tons of times and you know, here's how long it's gonna take you to feel better. Uh, I didn't know any of that. So it was, it, it felt like you were sort of, um, you know, driving blind in a way. We, and we also had very little to offer patients other than oxygen, other than intubation if they needed to go on a ventilator. And you know, eventually we started giving steroids and all this other, a few other things that, that may help a little. But that was the hard part was the sense of not just powerlessness, but 
a sense of, I can't even tell you what I think really, because we are in uncharted territory. You've been around dying people. I mean, it's part of your job. And I think one of the most devastating aspects of this pandemic is the idea of people dying alone. And I still will never get over thinking about them, thinking about their families, just as someone who's, you know, experienced losing my husband and my sister, to not have that human contact, to not be there for that person is just, it just leaves me feeling sick for all concerned. And did you witness any of that? Did you see doctors and nurses step in? I mean, I just, I still just cannot reconcile the idea of that happening to people. It just, it just breaks me, honestly. Yeah, that's, that's the worst. And I, I, I am very glad that these restrictions are loosening in many places. Um, there were, there were protocols in place that made sense at the time. Um, but the, the second we understood that there was a way to prevent, you know, that from being unsafe, that was a really important thing. Um, I, I, I personally in the ER, I saw a little less of that, although I have colleagues, you know, who saw that in the ICU and we, we just talked to them and, um, people who are really strong people just saying what you're saying, like, that's what broke them, you know? Um, what I would say is that when I would be intubating patients, when I was getting patients prepared to go on a ventilator, um, it's a lot of, it's unusual for us to do that with the patients who are really mentally and cognitively intact. Um, usually they're so sick, uh, from chronic diseases or, or, or like an accident that it, there's really no time. Um, with coronavirus, it's always a judgment call because the patients are deteriorating rapidly, but you're like, well, can we keep them off the ventilator? Can we keep, do we, do we have more time? Um, so you're always making this judgment call. And so a lot of times they, the oxygen levels would be so low and you just couldn't believe that the person was still okay. They didn't look great, but they didn't look as bad as our numbers were. And so in those cases, we started um, um, offering the patients the uh, video and saying, hey, do you wanna like send a video to your family? Do you wanna record something uh, or call anybody? And so we would do that and we would, you know, take time to let them do that in a few minutes. So we, there are, there are videos that people were able to send to their loved ones um, or last, you know, communications. In some cases that was their last communication. In many cases, it was the last communication for a while. But um, that became to me the most important thing that, that I could do is to say, look, we're never, there are cases where we just have, we gotta go, we gotta rush and get them, get them on the ventilator and just save their life. But whenever we could, and I give my residents credit for this, they, they were really leading on this. They say, wait, do we have time to do the video? And I, and I was like, you're right, we do, and, and let's do it. So that to me was this realization that, as you said, like this could be the last communication someone has. And you, I felt that that was something that was important to, to offer. And did you ever witness sort of FaceTime conversations? I mean, I just don't know how I could have seen that and not just completely fallen apart. Yeah, I definitely witnessed some of those conversations. And, um, you know, this, this, this virus, um, especially early on, I think the data still bear this out, but especially early on, the, the was affecting men more than women, like two to one, right, in terms of that. And, you know, men, we're not so good with expressing our emotions that we like to, you know, like you said, the kind of tough guy thing many, many times I feel like, uh, and I witnessed this, you know, there's this, uh, don't worry, I'm fine, I'm fine, you know, and so this, but occasionally you would see people be a little more open and emotional and, you know, it's hard to, it's hard not to immediately let that get to you. Um, a, um, so yeah, and, and I, I would say this, the, the moments I, the people I think really hit me the hardest were like friends of mine, like I would FaceTime with friends of mine who were in the ICU, so I had a couple of friends who got diagnosed and were really sick and to see the fear in their eyes. Um, so the, yeah, I mean, look, I'm very glad that we have FaceTime and video. It's one of the things about this that we don't ever stop to think about. Like if this pandemic had happened 20 years ago, we, we had the internet, but we didn't have this. And so this is so important, you know, like um, my kid can see her grandparents from across the country. And, uh, 
and people, but on the extreme end, people can have these, these important conversations. But yeah, I mean, it was hard, it was hard to watch and I, it, it didn't, it felt very similar actually to how I feel about actual um, unstable medical crisis. Like when I'm really uh, emotional or scared or worried, um, I feel it, but I kind of take it and I, I kind of keep it in one little place. I kind of like imagine almost like a singular little place where I store it like right here. And then I, I sort of let that energy drive my actions. And I feel like I did that with the with with those emotions. Like I see them, I, I acknowledge them. They hurt, um, but I'm just going to put them right here and just move forward with what I have to do next. Was there any one patient that, as you in ten years think back on what you went through and what the country and the world went through, is there one patient that you think of, Jeremy, that who will stick with you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I have a guy who, who survived and um, he was a middle-aged guy with a little bit of medical history, but not, not too sick. Um, you know, he's a guy who's got 40 years of life left, right? I mean, he's not like, and um, he came in just huffing and puffing, like just gasping for air. And, you know, at, by the time we, I saw him, it was sort of in the middle of the spring. And so I knew what these things looked like. And um, and I'd heard my friends say that they had intubated patients whose oxygen levels had been so low that usually we'll intubate a patient who is huffing and puffing with, a, with an oxygen saturation like the 70% range, 80% range if it's going down. If, and if they look bad, sometimes even higher than that. But, but you just don't see numbers like that. And my friends in New York and elsewhere were saying, oh, you know, I actually intubated a patient and um, their, their oxygen level was 50%. And that they were still awake and they were still breathing, but they didn't look great, but they were 50% and it was a good waveform, which means it was reliable. We could actually see that it was a real, a real reading. And um, now what that means is, of course, I'll just tell you just on the sort of inside baseball, the, the, the oxygen is being run off the finger. Probably in the central part of the body, the real numbers were higher. But we are not used to seeing even a peripheral reading like that in those in those in those ranges. And I thought, oh yeah, I'm sure you know war stories. And uh, and then I heard someone, oh yeah, actually I intubated somebody who had a wave uh, oxygen of 25 percent, 10 percent. Someone said, I was like, this is all it can't be. It's just war stories, like you know, like tall tales. But this guy came in at 77 percent, 75 percent. We put him on a mask, and he just kept going down. We did stop to do the video with him. And because uh, I was really worried he wasn't going to make it. And when, by the time we went to intubate him, his oxygen saturation was 1%, 1%. And I just was looking at the screen like, I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you? No. And I just looked again. It was like 2%. I was like, what in the world? I just could not believe it. And, um, and you know, we, we got the airway and we got him stabilized and um, he was, he, three weeks later, you know, he was okay and talking and walking around and he did okay. But I will just never forget looking at the screen and seeing the number 1% and looking at the waveform and saying, that's a real waveform and 2%, 1%. And then we intubated him and within 25 seconds, 30 seconds, 5%, 6%, 11%, 30%, 50, 80. And within two minutes, he's, his saturation is 100% um, on, on this innovate, on, on this ventilator. And I was like, this thing's a beast. This, this disease sucks. Um, and we are very lucky to survive it. So yeah, that patient. Wow. And he's still, and he's fine. Yeah. 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 He made it. I mean, it was, he was in the hospital for many weeks, um, but he survived. Let me ask you if you can do it in kind of lay, lay person's terms. You know, I've been talking to a lot of doctors through this and I have sort of a baseline level of medical understanding but in simple terms Jeremy what we watch this in real time and doctors and nurses had to learn like almost just try to you know wing it in some ways so what do we now know what is the standard of care for COVID patients okay so it really depends on your severity of disease and what I will say is that if you do not have what we call hypoxia, low oxygen, hypoxia just literally means oxygen is too low. If, if your oxygen levels are normal, 
there's really not a ton that I think makes a huge difference. I, I think that, you know, some of these monoclonal antibodies have been talked about. The, um, there's a very narrow group of people who that might help. Um, but for the most part, if you have normal oxygen, in my mind, you don't, there's not much we can offer you at this time. If you do have hypoxia, low oxygen, then the things that we know to give you are oxygen. And we don't know if that saves your life or anything, but it, the, the theory is that you get, your muscles just get less tired sooner. You, you crap out sooner. And your sorry. body has more energy to fight yeah. the virus, right? Yeah. Ostensibly that everything is better when you're oxygenated, right? So we'll never be able to test that because it's just, we give the oxygen. Okay. Um, and then the, the steroids, the dexamethasone steroid um, has really been shown to uh, have a, what we call a mortality benefit. It saves lives of people who need oxygen. A little bit among people who just need any kind of oxygen and a ton, uh, uh, 10 or 11% among people who need to be on ventilators. And when I saw that data, my eyes just bugged out because it was almost too good to be true. But it's, it's, it's so far, you know, it's, it's, I think it, it's probably mostly true. In other words, I think that the, it's the ballpark, you know, we'll never really know. But um, so that's a huge, huge thing is we give steroids to people who have low oxygen and that has a mortality benefit. Early on, we heard about this thing called a cytokine storm where mm -hmm. your immune system would get, would overreact to the virus. So it wasn't really the virus that was, tell me if I'm right about this, but the virus that was causing a lot of damage, organ damage to your heart, your lungs, et cetera. It was the reaction of your body to fight the virus. Mm -hmm. As has that been, have doctors been able to get that phenomenon under control? Not really. I think that, um, so yes, there's, uh, I'll say and Was that, that right, by the way? Was that an accurate description? Kind of, sort of? Here's the hard part of cytokine storm is no one knows what that really means. Cytokine storm is actually one of my favorite sentences written in the literature of the past year was in, in, in one of the Journal of the American Medical Association uh, magazines, someone was writing about cytokine storm. And like the second graph, they were like, by the way, no one has a good definition for this. No one actually knows what this is. Um, but I, th I was like, good point. We don't even know what we're talking about. Um, but, but I think that we, we all agree generally what, what, what that is, is that, as you said correctly, Katie, is that the, the body's own immune system can be too dysregulated. It can be too out of control. It can do the wrong thing. It's sort of flailing. Um, you know, it's sort of burning down the, the house. Um, it's not the best way. So there's, there has been many attempts to, um, to regulate this. And I think the steroids, the dexamethasone um, is one of those things. That is an immune modulator. It changes the immune system. It ramps it down. So probably that's one of the reasons why the steroids work. The, there have been fancy molecules um, tested, some of which are, um, uh, they're called the interleukin uh, inhibitors. These are um, and I've actually, you know, I'm an ER doctor, but even I, I now know how to say tocilizumab. It's a monoclonal antibody that goes, uh, that fights one of the cytokines that is uh, believed to be in part responsible for the sort of over, overreaction. The, the, those um, modulators, those immune modulators, largely disappointing. Um, there's been a little bit of a signal lately in a couple of subsets of patients in trials that suggest that it, there might still be a role for this, but um, Time, and same thing, uh, by the way, of the plasma. There's like, now we see like a, maybe a subset of patients who it could help. We also see patients who it can hurt. Um, and so my, the, the big story on therapeutics, the standard of care for me is that for the most part, the therapeutics have been um, disappointing and that maybe a few of them help a, a, a few subsets, but overall, um, the, the, the only way out of this thing is vaccination. What about giving people oxygen sooner? I know that some of my friends who are doctors said early on, you know, that 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 became, as you have said here today, Jeremy, that was, you know, the number one indicator. And as soon as you saw that dropping, you needed to get those people oxygenated right away. Has that affected, even that simple thing, affected outcomes in some ways? Actually, I don't know the answer to that. I think that um, we are certainly sending patients home with these like pulse oximeters. These are little, little things you can wear to, to, to monitor your oxygen. Um, and the idea being that if your numbers kind of drop before you realize it, um, it might be helpful for you. Or, or maybe you, you feel crummy, but you don't realize how crummy, right? Um, and this helps. 
it hasn't really been studied as far as I know uh, in terms of whether it helps or not. And there's also another totally important issue of equity around that. The pulse oximeters were actually um, not really optimized for, for people of color. And so you actually miss cases. And so I think that we need to, we need to, we need to expand pulse oximetry use. We also need to make sure that the devices are optimized so that everyone can use them. So I think that's really important. I, I don't know whether or not the early detection of uh, low oxygen has, you know, how does mortality benefit or not. I certainly will be honest, like when I've had friends and relatives who've had the disease, um, I've asked them if they have an oximeter and how they're doing. And it's something that I kind of watch as a doctor, just sort of keep keeping tabs of it. Um, but I can't tell you from like my own experience, whether that's just like me, like watching the pot, you know, like the water boil or if I'm actually having an, it's having an impact, but I certainly feel like, um, you know, it, it doesn't, it, it, it's, it's an important thing to pursue. Have they been able to figure out why this virus can completely lay someone out and even kill them while other people can get it and be totally asymptomatic? What is the secret biological sauce, Jeremy, that seems to be protective for some folks? I don't think we know that. I think we have some pieces of information that, that, that might help understand this. But, and I'll tell you a few things we learned that are not true. So one thing is people thought, well, maybe if you have exposure to other coronaviruses, if you have antibodies against some of the previous ones that you would be protected against this one. I thought that was a very attractive idea. Turns out not to be true. Turns out that you look at people who um, actually have antibodies to like common coronaviruses and they were no more or less likely to suffer from this coronavirus, unfortunately. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about blood types and you look into the, um, the papers that looked in the genetics the genetic footprints of people who had bad outcomes. And I do think there's what I call signal there that would say, okay, if you're a little more likely or less likely depending on your blood type, but it was, these are just at the margins, right? So it's like, okay, a few percent here and there. Clearly we know things about um, pre-existing conditions that have a big impact. And some of it surprised me. Okay, not gonna tell you that I'm surprised by the fact that diabetes is associated with worse outcomes. That's Diabetes is a very difficult disease to manage. It has immune implications and that didn't shock me at all. Um, not surprised to learn that people with chronic kidney disease have a harder time with this, with this virus, same kind of deal. But asthma, for example, I just would have assumed that asthma would have been a risk factor for bad disease, just hasn't been. And in almost, in almost any study that I have seen. So, and I don't know I why. thought it was. I thought people with asthma were really super concerned about the coronavirus because of, I guess, the lung impact yeah. of it. No, when is you that look not the, true? When you look at these uh, st kind of study of studies, right, they, they combine outcomes from various studies are called meta-analyses or even just systematic reviews of medical literature. The, the numbers for asthma just didn't add up to um, a problem in the, in the way that, it, that I thought it would. Now, that's not to say that people with asthma are fine. I mean, there are plenty of people, you know, these are averages, right? So, and it could be that there's different kinds of asthma and there's subsets and all this, but yeah, I, I, I would have thought that like asthma would really be a problem. And I'll tell you, when I realized this, like Chris Christie, Governor Christie went to the hospital and he mentioned he had asthma. And I remember looking into the literature and being like, wow, no, that doesn't make a difference surprisingly. So we're still learning this, but, but I think that your question is actually um, fascinating in another way, in the sense of we're, we're still learning all of this. I think we're still working it out. Um, but I will tell you that the, the question you ask is actually answers another question, which is why do we have a global pandemic? Why is SARS-CoV-2, why is COVID-19 the, the disease of our, of, our, of our lifetime in terms of an acute attack? And the answer is for what you said is that some people just get it and they're just fine and they can spread it. And other people will be on, you know, fighting for, the, for their lives within a week or two. And when you think about a, a pathogen like Ebola, that is not what happens with Ebola, right? Ebola, you get it and the, the your likelihood of, of fatality is double digits for all people, right? 20, 30, 40% would be a nice number, right? It's probably higher than that. Probably 50, 60% in many cases. And on top of it, Ebola, just while we're on the Ebola, like off ramp, is not that contagious until the end. So I always think about the, um, the, the guy who in Texas went to the ER, was diagnosed with pneumonia, sent home, um, took his meds, got worse, got worse. His family took care of him. 
he came back very, very sick and uh, got admitted to the ICU. And then two nurses got it in the ICU from him. He died. They, they did not. The nurses um, did survive. Well, I think they had some complications. Um, but his family didn't get Ebola, right? They never got it, even though they took care of him until the day he went to the hospital. And the transmission dynamics of Ebola are just such that when your viral levels aren't that high, you just apparently aren't that contagious, uh, right? So that's not SARS-CoV-2, that's not coronavirus. Coronavirus is really impossible to sort of track without um, like day-to-day testing. I have really come to believe that, this, that, that the way that coronavirus spreads is, um, I call it a geyser. And I can't, I, I'm not speaking for the scientific community here, but there's some literature to support this. And it's not like it's raining for a week and when the rain stops, you're, you're not contagious anymore. It's more like Old Faithful. So you could be right on top of the geyser and you could be dry as a bone and not get the virus. But then when that thing spouts water, you better not be in the zip code of it because the, the, the drops will reach you. And we see this in some of the, I always like to like get into the nooks and crannies of some of the medical literature. There's a couple of papers where they, they look at this. They say the patient's positive every single day for a week on the, on, the, on the PCR testing, on the genetic testing that we all do, but they're not always contagious. They don't have virus that can be grown in a dish every time. So it comes and it goes. And that's why people maybe didn't get it from their roommate, their cabin mates on the Diamond Princess cruise, right? You would think that everyone who was a, their spouse you know, would have gotten it or you know, their partner, not everyone did. Whereas some people went to their church choir and, and, and 70 people got it from one person. Like, how does that happen? And so I've, I'm beginning to think that the, the reason that coronavirus is so successful in spreading is a combination of the fact that it has, as you said, this crazy big range of, of symptoms while contagious, and also these windows of contagion that are really hard to track. Sounds like it can be activated and then go dormant and then be activated. And just in terms of, we're not talking about like people didn't sneeze or something Mm -hmm. like that. It's just the virus just wasn't contagious for, as you said, a window. And then suddenly it erupts and it infects everyone. I mean, we have so much to learn medically about this virus. Do you think, when do you think we'll, we'll know about it? I don't know. I think that, um, I don't know. I, I, you know, we're learning every day. I, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> I, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's just, I mean, I, I mean, do you think, do you think in five years we'll have a much better understanding of this virus, how and why it behaves the way it does and what has happened in the last year plus? Yes. I think there are three things that we're going to learn that are going to save lives going forward. So we've lost 500,000 lives in this country and millions of over the world across and one of the only things that like makes me like not just like collapse when i hear that number is to think um okay maybe we can learn so much from this that in the long run years from now we will save lives in the aggregate and when we cross that that threshold depends on two things how much we learn and how many lives we save today right so if we can keep that number low and our knowledge increasing then we can get there sooner and so one thing um, I think we're gonna learn about this virus, um, from this virus, is um, about transmission dynamics of lots of viruses. We're gonna learn all kinds of things about transmission dynamics. And so we're gonna understand how better to control disease. The second thing I think we're gonna understand a lot better is how to leverage the mRNA vaccine technology. This technology is truly impressive. It didn't happen overnight. It was, people say, oh, how do we get a vaccine in one year? And the answer is we didn't. This vaccine um, was, the rubber met the road in one year, but this vaccine took 20 years to develop. It took 200 years to develop in some ways because of our understanding. And now people say, look, what what are the things we can do now that we know this technology actually works? Um, And I I think that the the implications are huge. Might it help people with, with cancer in some cases? Might it help malaria vaccine? Can there be an Ebola vaccine? I don't know the answers to that, but I think that this this success story is just huge. And also um, um, what good can happen when we do trials correctly, when there's good regulation and there's good um, buy-in. 
the last we thing I want to talk that, 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 yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Say your last thing. And then I'm going to talk yeah. about health, health disparities. The last thing I think we might learn from this virus uh, that could be applicable to not just this virus, but many other conditions is the long-term consequences, the long COVID or long haul. I have no idea what we're going to call this. There's going to be different terminologies. Um, so I want to watch the way we say it, but, um, but we're just beginning to study this. And I think that, um, there are people who have acute diseases, like things that come and go, right? Like coronavirus, and they have long-term effects. And it's really hard to study that for most diseases because they're not always diagnosed with the right disease or there's just, there's just a few of them. Now we have a cohort of people, unfortunately, who we can really look at and work with together to learn about what happens to the body when it responds to a major, major insult like this virus is. And it, my guess is that the sort of long haul, long-term COVID syndrome that we're seeing is not particular to coronavirus itself, but is much more something that could happen as a result of many, many infectious disease, diseases. And if we can start to untangle how that is occurring and why and, and target that, it could be that we can help people avoid long-term suffering from a variety of diseases. So I think that this is why studying long-term um, symptoms of COVID is extremely important. I'm involved with a, with a group that's really putting the patients at the center of this. I mean, patients really, in a way, discovered this. Doctors did not discover this. It was patients talking about it. And, uh, but I think that we're receptive to that. So we should study that because we can actually um, learn from this. I had a friend whose wife was dealing with a lot of uh, medical issues after she quote unquote recovered from COVID. And, you know, it was almost as if doctors were saying it was all in her head, you know, and, and I think also in fairness to the medical community, it was so focused on helping these patients. It didn't really have time to look at this long tail that this virus might be creating for people. When it comes to this, vi the pandemic has really laid bare the health equities. Uh, this virus has really laid bare the health disparities that exist in this country. And I know that you realized it almost immediately when you saw some patients in the Brigham ER, didn't you? Oh yeah, I mean, it was just uncanny. And I give credit to my colleagues, um, Black, physicians, persons of color in the medical uh, community who I work with, who um, pointed this out, you know, you know, to say, look, have you noticed something here? And, and the answer is, yeah, I have, but it, it takes, you have to really advocate and you have to go out and, and make it um, a priority to, to educate the public and to make sure that we're, that every member of our community is a part of the best prevention and the best treatment that we can offer. And um, I always understood, I thought I understood this before. I really thought I did, right? Um, but I didn't, I, di I, I did not. Um, I hate to admit it, like I just never really, it never really landed as much as it landed this year, um, just to see the numbers. When I looked at, for example, um, among uh, adults aged 25 to 44, this is a paper that I wrote <clears throat> with uh, then Professor Walensky, now CDC Director Rochelle Walensky. You know, she and I uh, worked on a paper together and we, uh, young people dying of coronavirus. And we didn't have the data in time for this paper, but others have seen it since. It's not just that black and Hispanic people were disproportionately affected by coronavirus among adults aged 25 to 44. It's that black and Hispanic people were the majority of deaths among, uh, mathematical majority among the deaths in this country of coronavirus in young adults. And that to me is just, unbelievable, um, it's, it's an unbelievable um, in, indictment of, of the system failing people and that we need to really shake it up and, and, and rebuild. So the- I read, I read that in addition to racial disparities, Spanish speakers had a 35% greater chance of death than English speakers and that you all got some uh, you know translators into the ER to help these folks, but I mean, that's just mind boggling too, isn't it? By the time, I'll, look, I'll say one thing with a little bit of like sort of um, one piece of good news is that by the time that 
when adjusted for disease severity and, and, and everything else, once the patients are in the hospital, the outcomes were appropriately sort of distrib distributed. So in other words, the hospital care has been, has been equal um, in terms of outcomes. That, made, that, was, that gave me a sigh of relief to see that. But what, what we have not uh, seen, is, we have seen, I should say, is that the disproportionate numbers who show up on our doorstep. So, and, and so you have to reach the community because if you do have a patient who is showing up far sicker than you know, white populations, for example, we need to understand why. We wanna understand like why, where's the messaging that we can reach them? Why, where, how are we failing? How are we not able to do that um, messaging and, and outreach and care? So that by the time people come to the hospital, the disparities are already playing out in front of your in front of my eyes. So yes, um, and in fact, um, when you look at the waves um, of this of this pandemic, Hispanic people in particular have had a really rough go in every wave. The third wave, the December, January, you know, November, January, the Hispanic, the excess mortality, the extra number of deaths and the COVID deaths in the Hispanic community continues to be an absolute disaster. And I just, it, it breaks me. What's interesting is that we have seen in the black population, um, a little bit of a comeback story there. The early on the black population, just devastating numbers. I mean, again, as I said, like I thought I got it, but I didn't get it until I saw it, you know? And, but then over the summer and in the fall, the numbers fall and fall. And at this point later in the, in the crisis, um, there still is excess mortality among, among Black Americans, but it's actually pretty similar to white Americans, uh, which is really interesting. I think that some of my colleagues who've been out there making the case about, about access and disparities have actually had measurable success and they're saving lives. They have saved more lives by their words on CNN or on the internet than I've ever saved intubating a patient. I, I, my hat is off and um, it's amazing to see and uh, I want to see it continue, but we haven't seen um, uh, that. We haven't seen the drops that we want to see in every in every ethnicity and race. And so we still have a lot of work to do. So it's unclear whether it's you know physiological considerations you know that are making certain populations uh, more likely to to get sicker and die, or it's access to care you know, basically income inequality uh, that results in people living in cramped quarters, people not having healthy diets, uh, you know, all the things that go hand in hand with poverty in this country. So, yeah, I would actually, I would not even put it as an either or. So what I would say is I don't think that these massive disparities have anything to do with genetics. So in other words, um, you know, there might be, like I said, the blood type might have a small little on the on the margins, but um, in terms of but the, the disparities, in terms of access, really has to do with whether a patient or a person arrives at the moment of infection with a a series of conditions that are preventable that were preventable, um, that then render their risk factors like off the charts, right? So that to me is baked into. The, the, these social determinants of health, these, these systemic factors of inequality, racism that play out in a sort of magnified way um, suddenly. So it's not that um, you know, one uh, community or another has genetics that is hurting them. That's not the situation at all. It's that the diabetes and the hypertension and the kidney disease and all these other things that, that make a difference, smoking actually even is a, that's something that makes a difference, uh, we, we learned. Um, which is not equally distributed across uh, race and um, income. All these things, when you arrive at the moment of, of infection, um, have have tremendous implications for your outcomes. And so, what we what we need to do is to acknowledge all of that, and to say that um, part of our prioritization of what we do in the next 10, 20 years needs to acknowledge that, that it's not just about long term; it's about long term and also what when you preparing for crisis. So the social determinants of health really have an impact on the physical determinants of health is That's the right. bottom line. That's right. So social, the social factors are what deny people access to uh, preventative care or to modulate diseases that all of us would get if it weren't for the correct medical interventions. 
So some of us are able to avoid it because we're privileged and we're plugged in and others of us are not. And so then um, at the moment that you're infected with coronavirus, you know, you're punished or whatever because of society's, you know, society's um, choices, our, our, our unfortunate um, structure. So yeah, like I said before, like there, I, I, the horizon for me is like, okay, what, will we, what will, will we have learned? Is what we learn enough to save lives um, sooner? And the opportunity is there. Like we can learn enough that we can save millions of lives in the future. Uh, if we, the opportunity is there, but it, it is the commitment, is the will to change the system there. Well, that's, uh, I, I hope so. I hope so. There's, there's going to be, there's going to be a window of opportunity where I think people will be interested in supporting uh, these endeavors, uh, both financially and sort of logistically. And uh, I hope so. As we wrap up, I just want to ask you about mental health. At the beginning of this pandemic, Jeremy, I was so worried about the healthcare workers and their mental health because you could see it in their eyes. They were exhausted. It was just so stressful, everything about this. And I felt like they weren't getting the support they needed. And I'm curious, what's your, what are your thoughts on, on that? I read that doc, I read that physicians have the highest suicide rate of any profession, which I had no idea, honestly. Um, and, and I can only imagine the stress that was placed on them and nurses and support staff during this pandemic in terms of mental health. What have we learned about that? I think we're still learning a lot. Um, so I'll tell you my own journey a little bit, which is that in the early phase, I think as, as we talked about, I had a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety that I didn't really acknowledge, but I just sort of channeled into a pretty productive period of my life. Like I got a lot of stuff done, I felt proud about it and I could just go to work and do my job. Um, but my mental health took a hit really in the summer, in the fall, watching people die while all over the country, while messages that would have saved their lives were being undermined. So that made, that, that, that just, that, that really, that hurt me. Um, but other people have had different um, experiences. They saw things like my colleagues in New York that just, you know, they never thought they'd have to see. I have friends, I have one friend in particular who she was an ER doctor um, and she worked in, you know, on the ground during the Iraq war. And she said that what she saw in New York this spring was worse in terms of her mental health, in terms of what she had to kind of channel through and, and go through. Um, so I, I think it hits all of us in different ways. In some way, I I don't want to make us like you know martyrs because we, we signed up for this. And also we, in a weird way, we're the lucky ones in the sense that um, every day when I wake up, I know in the spring, especially I knew what to do. I knew what to do. I just go to work and do my job. And so the mission sort of helps, um, helped me to stay kind of focused. And, but so but many people, they wake up and they didn't know what to do. And all they could do is worry. And they didn't have a way to channel it into something positive. Um, because they had to stay home and so the best you could do is like stay home like that was like that's not really all that exciting or you know netflix is you know great and everything but it's not like you know it's only going to take you so far right so and you a way, had a thought, purpose you had a sense of purpose that's right so i feel like that's what i think is really harming people outside of medicine so we were lucky in a sense that we always had that purpose um sure we, we on the back of the you know, on the other hand, we're like, yeah, well, if we're such heroes, how come you can't give us some more PPE, huh, folks? Yeah, come on, bring it on. But, um, but I, I really think that sustained many of us. Um, but there, are, uh, look, yeah, there have been overwhelming situations, and you know, colleagues of mine have died by suicide um, this year, and it's just, it's, it's, it just wrecks me. The, the, the part that I think is so um, a, undetermined is. The overall effect on not just healthcare workers, but all of us. I will tell you that in the first half of last year, suicide rates in the United States went down as uh, compared to usual. They were lower than usual, which kind of surprised me. I thought they might maybe be stable. I didn't think that they would go up, but they actually went down nationally. We don't know about the fall of the winter. 
But we do know that lots of other markers went up, like it got worse, right? Lots and lots of mental health um, sort of uptick in, in needs for services, kids. We don't know this. It's really hard to track, by the way. It's super, so hard to track. But um, so I think that um, we are still trying to figure that out. And as far as I'm concerned, um, the sort of PTSD or the long-term mental health implications of my colleagues really has to do with what you saw. So for me, it wasn't the clinical part, um, although that was certainly burned in my mind. I mean, I'll never forget these patients, but for me, the, 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 the mental fatigue has been much more around a sense of exacerbation that um, we could save you know, so many lives by doing things better and um, in the sense of panic almost that we're not gonna do any better next time. That's, that's the part that I think I, uh, um, Dr. Katie and my therapist here, I need you to help me with because it does, it's still, it's still, it's still something I'm, I'm processing. I think we all are. Those doctors, you know, who took their own lives, uh, did that come out of nowhere? So the, you know, Lorna Breen, who was a physician in New York, I only met in passing a couple of times at conferences. I didn't know her personally. Um, but so yes, a totally shock. And, and, but I have, you know, many colleagues who, who work with her in particular, and they had absolutely, you know, no idea that, um, that she was at risk. And I don't, I don't necessarily know if she was. Um, and, and, and what I will say about what I've learned about suicide, studying suicide during the pandemic this year, is that um, suicide is a very complicated um, disease. And it's, um, at the end of the day, it's, a, um, it's actually an impulsive act. It's, a, it's, it's very frequently, um, you know, there are many factors that, that, that go into it, but the actual decision itself is not like, you know, it's, it's, it's very impulsive. And so that's why people um, who, who really work on this and study this all the time um, point out that like survivors often say like, they're glad that they didn't succeed. I mean, not everyone says that, but some do. Um, and the, you know, things like access to, to handguns and these kinds of things can make a tremendous difference um, because if you can, if the, if the person who's in that state has an opportunity to slow down and to not have that impulse, then literally they live to see another day and they can get the help that they need. Um, you know, for, for healthcare workers, um, yeah, any stressor, you know, whether you're a healthcare worker or whether you're uh, someone who's in the military or whether whatever it is, anything can be a stressor. And I think that this pandemic has stressed all of us. So um, I do I do spend a lot of time um, thinking about how do we approach the next few months because, or even or the ones we are in right now, um, where it's, it's been a year. It's a long time, it's really a long time. And the effects of, of this add up and um, how my mental health um, colleagues are, um, you know, they're doing great work, but they have the work cut out for them. Finally, um, I hate to even ask this question, Jeremy, but what about the next pandemic? I know I don't even want to let my mind go there, but will there be other pandemics? Is this just the beginning of a new era of these kinds of you know, quandaries and devastating events. I don't know. I think that um, I think about I think about this a lot, <clears throat> and um, one of the hardest things that we're going to face is recognizing a new problem that comes our way, and actually knowing if it's if it's real or not. And I think that. Um, with COVID-19, there was something, there was some sense of, oh, you know, Zika didn't kill too many people and Ebola never came here. And 2009, you know, the H1N1, you know, there was a few outbreaks in the United States, but we did okay. Um, now we've seen what can happen and that we're not immune, literally. Um, and so I actually think that there are two extreme reactions we could have. We could have the Every time any outbreak occurs anywhere, we could shut down immediately and we could paralyze ourselves over nothing. Or we could have the, oh, come on, it's not, this is, this is not, this is, you know, um, this is not COVID-19, this is not 1918. Um, you know, it can't happen again. Um, and so I spent a lot of time thinking about 
how do you actually um, find the, the balance? How do you surveil? How do you look for the problem so that you're not overreactive or underreactive? It's really difficult. I think that there are actually great ways to achieve that. I think that we actually know so much more than we did a year ago. And some of the stuff we, the, the epidemiology community knew this stuff a year ago, but there was just not any um, mechanism or interest in rolling it out. So now there might be. So for example, I'll give you a really interesting, I think example of, of what would help me understand in, in January, February, what we were about to encounter. The studies that came out of China about coronavirus gave us a, a, a picture of an outbreak of disease that was pretty interesting and pretty concerning. But what I didn't know, it, they didn't provide, um, was a sense of what's normal in terms of the, the, a particular hospital. So I got, look, this is a disease that clearly kills older people a lot. Um, this is a disease that broke out and it's very contagious. But what I didn't get was, oh, and by the way, um, our hospital admission rate for the entire province of 30 million people was triple our usual rates for these kinds of time of year. I didn't get, we had excess mortality within a week, which you can actually detect. And so what I think we need, so I would like to have known that. And that, that's not the fault of the researchers in China. It's not the fault of anyone. We didn't do that here in America when, when we started publishing our papers early on in the crisis. We just sort of did the thing where we just describe a disease and put it out there. Well, that could, the same paper could be written about a disease that ends up being a dud and fizzles out, you know? So what we need to know, what we need to do is to provide everyone with a context and say, okay, there's an outbreak and here's the numbers and here's how it compares to sort of normal. And that can be done with the right surveillance mechanisms, but it's gonna take an international effort, WHO, UN, um, CDC funding from here and abroad. Um, that would really help because then we can actually get a sense of, oh, well, this is a, this is one of, this is the, a real one versus, no, this is, this is interesting and, and scary, but uh, we don't need to like close the borders. So I think that number one is how do we even, how, how, how can we have a radar detector that is um, not too sensitive but not sensitive enough for the one that's Goldilocks. And that's, I think, what we're gonna be working on very carefully in the next couple of years. I think that's awesome. I wanted to know, you wrote Mike Pence and didn't get a lot of satisfaction from, from him at, or the Trump administration. Do you have more confidence in the Biden administration to put the things in place that need to be in place to approach this in a holistic way to help states to coordinate it better with global efforts, you know, all the things that we didn't do well last time. They have shown a lot of interest in engaging my colleagues, the scientific community. There, there have been calls and meetings um, where the administration tells us uh, things. It's not really a conversation. It's more like a they're informing us of what they're up to and they just want us to know a few of us. And, um, and but there's also a mechanism, I think, um, within that community of, of physicians, scientists and other experts to, um, to ask questions and to have those questions heard. Um, so my sense is that um, they're engaged very much with the, the scientific community, the experts, the, the experts that we have in this country, American expertise on these issues truly is uh, world class. Um, but it's, um, it's, it's unfortunate that it wasn't always utilized in, in the last year. So what I think today we see is a much more fluid conversation between the government and the best experts that, that we have um, and a more honest appraisal of where we're at. I think that's all really helpful. Uh, I think that's, uh, you know, Rochelle, Dr. Walensky, um, I, I know that she gets it because I know her. And so um, they're very responsive. So I, I, that gives me a great amount of confidence or at least much more confidence. The, the question I think is an open one that you ask is that, um, what about next time? Or when's, it, is our attention gonna, going to be pulled away so that we, you know, right now we're willing to throw money at the problem to get vaccines out there. and the $1.9 trillion package of which a lot of which is about these issues. But I really truly hope that um, when this crisis abates that we put the appropriate amount of money into the kinds of things that will make next time better. Look, it's funny, I, I did a lot of television like last year 
and I had this talking point that I like, never got out there. And I was like waiting for like Wolf Blitzer or someone to ask me like, the right question so I could like say it. Where I was, I was like, okay guys, like the proposal for Space Force has more funding than CDC. Like that's bonkers, right? Like, I don't know, I'm sure Space Force would be very cool and very neat. Um, and I like the uniforms and everything. It looked really cool, but like, come on, the CDC needs money. And, uh, and, and if you need anyone to tell you how to spend it, here are the names of 50 experts who will tell you how to spend it and guaranteed it will save money in the long run because we will not have um, another crisis like this. Or if we do, it'll be much uh, more well handled. Problem is whenever you prevent something, no one ever appreciates it. Right? I want only, you, you, you never know about the, uh, you know, the, the, for every shoe bomber, right? Remember the shoe bomber, the guy, you know, like we hear about those ones and it's like, okay, but you never hear about that with the medicine. It's like, oh yeah, there was a, there was a bullet that we dodged. You know, if we're successful, people think that nothing's happening. Um, but unfortunately um, we have to live with that. So I hope that the administration, this one or whoever is in charge when this is over, um, has the same eagerness that I sense today uh, in addressing this crisis, in preparing for the next one and addressing for the next one.